More than a hundred years ago, during the Civil War, the general led an historic chase from Big Shanty, Georgia, to Ringgold, Tennessee, 87 miles away. Then, the trip took 10 hours. Today, a modern diesel engine travels at speeds up to 60 miles an hour. In between these two trains, there's been a lot of progress. We'll see how a modern railroad operates today when Discovery goes along on the fast freight to Nashville. Discovery 70, the award-winning program for young people with Virginia Gibson and Bill Owen. That's number 73 out of Cincinnati pulling 130 cars. It'll stop at Louisville and then go on to Nashville. Number 73 belongs to the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, known to railroad men as the L&N. Although it's the L&N, it could be any railroad. A freight train is made up of cars from railroads all over the country. Freight cars with raw sugar from Louisiana to be refined for breakfast in New York. Lumber from the Pacific Northwest forests to build homes in Georgia. Special tank cars with chemicals from Delaware to make plastic toys in St. Louis. Automobiles from Detroit for the highways of New Mexico. The makeup of the train is carefully planned to keep the switching at a minimum. That's what helps to keep the freight moving fast. This is the strawberry yard at Louisville, and we're now adding on cars that will be going on farther south. Fourteen of the freight cars in number 73 will be cut off in Louisville. They're at the end of the train, making it easy to take them out. The switching engines are something like tugboats, especially built for pushing and pulling rather than long hauling operations. The switching and making up of new trains is completed in a couple of hours. Okay. It was once a process that took days.
Today, railroading moves fast. At the beginning, a little more than 100 years ago, a sturdy little engine called the General made an exciting 87-mile run in 10 hours. During the Civil War, the General carried troops and ammunition for the South right to the battlefront. Some Union agents stole the locomotive on its way from Atlanta to Chattanooga and attempted to drive it across enemy lines to the north. It was a daring plan and just as vigorous and daring a pursuit. To delay their pursuers, the northern raiders destroyed the track behind them. They cut telegraph wires, tried to burn down bridges. The southern pursuers at first used a little hand push car. Then they found a locomotive facing the wrong way, which they put into reverse and continued the chase often getting close enough to see the general. At times, the engine did almost 60 miles an hour, an unheard of speed for that time. The Union raiders and the general dropped cross ties behind them, hoping to derail their pursuers. But finally, the general ran out of fuel at Ringgold. The great chase was over, and the raiders jumped off the train into the nearby woods. The General was a wood-burning engine, but coal soon became the fuel for the big steam engines needed to pull the heavy freights. This is one of the last of the steam locomotives, and one of the biggest. Its driving wheels are almost six feet in diameter. Steam engines are classified by their wheel arrangements, starting from the front. This 284 has two leading wheels, the eight driving wheels in the center, and the four in back under the firebox. The solid portion of the wheel is a counterbalance to offset the weight of the driving rods. These old steam locomotives now stand quietly in an outdoor museum. Their work done. They've been replaced by modern oil-burning diesels with greater power and speed. What's it like to ride in the cab of a huge diesel locomotive? We'll see as we travel on a fast freight to Nashville. We'll do that in just a minute. Number 73 is getting ready to roll. Air hoses for the brakes are coupled up and the brakes are tested. Learning to be a railroad engineer takes a lot of on-the-job experience. Sam Spinelli, train master, uses the cab as a classroom to teach apprentice engineers. Due to the fact that when somebody makes a coupling, he's liable to bump his head. We should always remember these things. Safety is very important uh, in, uh, when you're out on the line of road. Remember these things. and going of the freight trains are part of the life of the small towns along the way. 
In some towns, the train goes right down the main street. People know the sound and meaning of the crossing whistles. There are industrial areas along the way where raw materials can be brought to the factories and the finished product shipped out. For much of the trip, the train passes through rich farmland. It's an important means of getting produce to market and for bringing machinery and supplies back to the farm. Often the engineer picks up his orders on the run. They warn him to look for crews working on the roadbed along his route. Brakeman at the head end and the conductor and flagman in the caboose keep a constant watch for trouble. And sometimes they find it. They've spotted smoke. LNM 273's engines to LNM 273's caboose. LNM 273's caboose. Well, how's it look on those stuck brakes back there? Did that smoke clear up? From back here on the caboose, Mr. Spinelli, everything looks okay. The brakes are released. Don't see any smoke. Okay, fine. That means you won't have to stop and cut any brakes off. Fine. Uh, you know, of course, you've got to remember that each car uh, has two drawbars, and of course, each drawbar has approximately six inches of slack, so you take that and multiply that by 130, 140, or maybe 150 cars, uh, you have a considerable amount of slack. And if you don't handle the slack properly, why, well, you can snap a train in two with, with no effort at all. So that's why it's so important to know the whereabouts of the various portions of your train, because by improper brake handling or improper throttle handling, you can allow the slack to come in uh, abruptly. You may part your train. trains pass each other, the crews are always on the alert, looking for any sign of trouble on the other train. When number 73 pulls into Nashville, its 130 cars will be headed for as many as 50 different cities farther south. The cars are sorted out in a hump yard. How do you get the right car on the right train? We'll find out in just a minute. This is the Radnor Yard in Nashville, Tennessee. The train we've been on will now be divided up into various sections and sent on to Chattanooga, Memphis, Mobile, New Orleans, Atlanta.
terminal superintendent of the Radnor Yard is G.D. McCall. Here in just a few minutes, are you going to be ready to make up 75? Yes, sir. Okay, what track will you use? Do you know yet? No, sir, don't, Mr. Matter. We know only use 41, 2, and 5, but I don't know. Okay, well, we'll, we'll let you know shortly then what you'll use, Carl. Thank you. Okay, sir. The overall general purpose of this yard is to classify trains that come into us unclassified. And to do this, uh, we have 56 tracks to classify our trains into. Of those 56 tracks, I would say 48 would be different cities located on different portions of the railroad. A train coming into us uh, would possibly have cars on it for as many as uh, 40 of those 48 cities. So it is our job to uh, classify or sort out these cars into separate tracks in our classification yard. And these separate tracks are each uh, filled up with cars for one city. And this is later made up into a train which goes to the particular city. When 273 arrives in our receiving yard from Louisville, uh, the hump engine uh, comes through on it, shoves it to the hump, and uh, the pin puller has a list showing him where to cut the cars. Then the pin puller uh, takes this list, and as the train is shoved over the hump at a mile and a half to two miles an hour, he will pull the, the cut levers, and the cut levers separate the two cars. And uh, he'll hold on to this cut lever now until the car that's going off uh, is taken by gravity, and then it gets over the center of gravity and starts down the hump. Uh, it picks up speed real sharply then and goes on into the master retarder. A, a retarder is a series of uh, steel plates located on each side of the rail that the car rolls over which uh, comes up and closes against the wheel of the car and exerts pressure on the wheel of the car to slow it down. The uh, uh, degree in which the retarder operator sets the power up will uh, govern how much pressure is put against the wheel of the car. If it's a heavy load, it'll put uh, the full pressure on it. If it's a light load, why, they probably will use one section only of the master retarder. We have to uh, retard the cars after they uh, separate on the hump and come over the hump because of, uh, if they were not retarded, they would go in and strike at a speed that would damage both the car and the contents of the car. We would like for all cars that are switched into our classification yard to go down and couple on to the car that's uh, north of it at a speed not to exceed four miles per hour. We will have arriving in our yard approximately 35 trains and humping in the neighborhood of 23 to 2400 cars. Now these cars, of course, will be classified and made up into approximately 35 trains departing our yard each day. Our hump is operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year. The freight is moving faster in boxcars today than uh, it ever has before. The clack of a train ride caused by joints between the rails isn't heard as often these days because rails are now being welded into long lengths. William Lutz supervises the welding shop here. The operation here consists of uh, taking rail in 39 foot lengths and putting them in our welding machines and turning out the rail approximately a quarter of a mile. We require 37 of these rails to make one quarter mile length. And with an oxyacetylene flame, we heat these rails up to approximately 1,800 to uh, 2,000 degrees. And with pressure being applied, uh, they are forced together, making the what we call a pressure weld.
tomorrow, another number 73 will move more freight from Cincinnati to Louisville and from there to Nashville. Engineers, brakemen, conductors, flagmen, and switchmen working together to move the freight. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed Fast Freight to Nashville. If you'd like to find out more about railroading, then ask your librarian for these books. Trains at Work by Mary Elting and Railroads in the Days of Steam by Albert L. McCready. Be sure to be with us next week for another exciting program as Discovery continues to discover the world. Bye-bye. Bye. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News.